Patrick, this is uh, Peter Pham at One Road Research. I've read a lot of what you've been doing and it sounds absolutely fascinating and welcome onto our podcast. Nice to be with you. So I've heard you discuss a lot about Karl Popper and it sounds like he's been very influential towards your approach to thinking. Perhaps you could share some of that perspective and I'm a big fan of falsification myself and I, I don't know if the audience that's listening, which is primarily finance focus, has an appreciation for the philosophy of science. So maybe you could start off there. Well, Popper is a very influential philosopher of science, obviously. And he defined science as opposed to what he called pseudoscience as science must be something that is falsifiable. In other words, science must state hypotheses that make predictions that can be tested against reality. And ideally, uh, science is most robust if it makes what Popper called difficult predictions. I'll give you an example of a difficult prediction. Sure. Einstein's theory uh, predicts that gravity will bend light. That's certainly counterintuitive, but I believe it was the 1918 total eclipse. Uh, it was indeed discovered that stars changed their position relative to the sun, and in, in the closer ones were, in fact, um, closer than they should have appeared. So gravity indeed did bend light. That's a difficult prediction which underlies a very complicated theory, and it's nice to see that occur. Now, if science, if a so-called science explains everything, then nothing can be tested. And Popper calls that pseudoscience. His favorite pseudosciences, by the way, were psycho psychoanalysis and Marxism. I'm afraid that we have some modern versions of apparently untestable or very difficult to test science if we follow issues like climate change, where it seems like for every phenomenon that occurs, be it a hurricane or even a winter storm or even a cold spell, some scientist gets on there and says that's consistent with global warming. Well, if, some, if everything is consistent with global warming, it then is not a testable science and therefore is, is in fact a pseudoscience. Right. Let's dive deeper into this subject about climate change. Uh, but prior to doing that, I, I think what I wanted to try to isolate here is like I'm, I'm we what we specialize is in observation of, of capital markets and directly or indirectly that's connected to economics from a macro perspective. Where does certain fields like it, when you're touching in fields that have elements of art to it how does one approach it in the most rational way possible so like you mentioned you mentioned communism or socialism clearly there's many different economic and political schools of thought at the end of the day it is an art though so for us to just strictly isolate and talk about marxism and say that's a pseudoscience relative to say another kind of ism how do we address that how does the rational mind approach the arts in using elements of the scientific method well that's a very complicated question because because you're you're trying to rationalize a creative process and you're trying to apply logic right. uh, where logic need not apply. Mm -hmm. I, I've always been amused by by the cramming of formal logic studies into graduate students as if that's the way the world works, as if that's where creativity comes from. It does not. So yeah, it's uh, we, we can't apply Apple's logic to an orange's process, and I'm afraid that's what we do when we try and scientificalize art and creativity. Okay. So in overall, excuse my ignorance towards this, but in terms of weather analytics, is that segmented more of an art as opposed to a science? It can be both. I, okay. in, in designing an analytical model, you often will use obviously quantitative techniques, but how you apply them is a matter of creativity. Right. Uh, you know, we can shape numbers, and I'm not talking about um, uh, manipulating numbers. I'm talking about we can shape the way we analyze things to model a situation. Mm 
Mm-hmm. I, I can give you an example that is very concrete. You know, you have those plants that are growing in your in your room or in your garden. Right. They largely respond to two things in terms of their growth, temperature and moisture. Mm-hmm. And it turns out if you shape the temperature and moisture data in right. a certain way, you're able to predict the growth of the plant. Uh, for what it's worth, if you take temperature and precipitation anomalies and express them as a second-order Taylor series expansion, you'll be surprised how the coefficients that go on to that expansion can explain pr- plant growth. So there is the researcher taking the data, yeah. essentially giving it life and making it mimic a complicated process by shaping it. Right, right. This this is absolutely what I love, and this is what I I wanted to initiate for, in terms of this conversation is because when we do financial analysis and we're building up uh, models and trying to extrapolate potential valuations of businesses, sure. I always say to my colleagues, it's garbage in, garbage out. And hopefully we can try to find ways in which we can explain anomalous behavior to uh, identify opportunities that exist in the market. But if you're strictly inputting the incorrect variables, then you might come up with an undesired uh, forecast or projection. And it's some of the observations that you made in, in terms of climate change is related to that. Could you share some of that perspective and, and your approach to deciphering those components? Well, I think actually we, could, we can go into, into uh, so technical analysis, if you will. You, you see people glibly throwing concepts back and forth as if they're realities that have predictive capability. Yeah. Uh, you know, oh, this is the inverted M pattern. No, I think it's the W pattern. Yes, well, absolutely. You're, there are an infinite number of, of ways that you can view essentially um, what I would call a, an, a slightly ordered random process, which is what a market is, right. and come up with seeming explanations because uh, there's so many degrees of freedom in the system for you to take advantage of. Yeah. You know, if you take all the information out of a system, by the way, in describing it, and that's a very easy thing to do, uh, it will fit the past perfectly and predict the future never. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So I, I think we have to be careful. And I do like to go back to the issue of climate change because there are so many degrees of freedom in the climate system. I mean, how many different variables can you think of that? just observational variables that would be related to climate, rainfall, snowfall, wind, high temperature, low temperature, mean temperature, right. percentile temperature. I mean, you can really, you, there are so many variables that you can pick enough of them that you'll seemingly have predictive capability for them. When you start to actually predict, you find your predictions don't work out real well. And, and Patrick, what's so fascinating is you just mentioned about technical analysis in, in terms of capital markets and the analysis right. of stock prices. I wrote this book uh, called The Big Trade, Simple Strategies for Maximum Market Returns, focusing on the, the unification between technicals and fundamentals. And ultimately, what we discuss about is quantitative approaches to analyzing price because that's the underlining asset class that you're observing and and what we state basically is that you can't forecast markets you can strictly observe markets as probabilistic uh, permutations that could happen if your sole objective is to understand price and behavior of markets i think your your ultimate objective of course is a modicum of predictability based yes. upon your observations of the system yeah. and obviously in the longest run that modicum doesn't have to be very large you may be able to squeeze signal out of that type of data uh you know your uh, people might lose a lot of money on the way to getting there it would be like a signal that would return maybe 101 percent of the input you can you can lose a lot on the way to getting that one percent Yep, it's quite an effort to try to identify like anomalous behavior and understand the probabilistic components as it relates to it. For example, what we discuss about in the book, and obviously we got to get back to climate changes, what we discuss about the book is about 70 to 80% of the time, the previous day's high or low 
is basically surpassed. And that is actually a very interesting anomaly when understanding about markets, and that's applicable on a weekly basis or applicable on a monthly basis as well. It's very rare that the stock market ranges within the previous day's range. It happens basically some less than 20% of the time, and therefore one could actually build some interesting a uh, probabilistic uh, understanding towards the market and its behavior. Say you're approaching yesterday's low or you're approaching yesterday's high and, and there's numbers that are quantifiable towards that. So that's quite interesting. But I think the reason why I wanted to discuss about that is, again, connecting it back to how you approach the weather analytics. And I know that you discuss about how the international community has come up with um, various different models. I think you highlight it's like 30 something models. Why is, what's going on? What is the fallacy towards their construction of the model? And is there anything a little bit more sinister towards why the models are, are inputted with the variables that they have? Oh, well, that's, well, first of all, there's a lot of politics involved here. Yes. <laughs> uh, this is a very, this is a very trendy field. And Nobody ever maintained uh, funding by saying that maybe it's not a problem or something like that. Right. Uh, and as a result, uh, there are 32 different families of models. Some countries have more than one, like the United States has several. And of those 32, only one of them seems to be a- capable of tracking the three-dimensional temperature through the tropical atmosphere, which is very important because that's where moisture from originates from around the world, in, in, in the world, basically. And that model is, by the way, the Russian model. But the problem is that they were all constrained, erroneously, I believe, to simulate the warming of the early 20th century as a function of greenhouse gases and other an- anthropogenerated changes. Well, we really hadn't, there were two warmings of the 20th century. One is from 1910 to 1945, uh, and it's about 0.45 degrees C. And the second one begins around 1976 and either slows down or ends somewhere in the late 1990s, depending upon whose data you're looking at, only to resume with the big El Nino event that began around 2014. But you see, by 1910, when the first warming started, we had only changed the carbon dioxide concentration from a background of 280 parts per million to about 298. 18 parts per million would not seem to be enough to initiate a warming of nearly a half a degree Celsius. So that means that the models were then constrained or modified, if you will, to be more to be extremely sensitive to carbon dioxide, which is why, in my humble opinion, uh, so many of them, 31 out of 32 families, seem to be way over predicting tropical warming because we made them be so sensitive by forcing them to to simulate the warming of the early 20th century that they should not have been doing. So, Patrick, have you looked at all the specifications towards all the 30 plus models and observe the component of sensitivity? When we look at finance, we refer to the phrase as a sensitivity analysis, basically. Yeah, well, to do that, I mean, all I can tell you is the number of variables that can be tuned in order to generate a sensitivity is humongous. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it is very clear. Uh, it's very much like what we were talking about earlier. A system that has a lot of degrees of freedom, you can pretty much jiggle the observed data any way you want and fit the observations perfectly, which is what happens when you say, aha, fit the warming of the early 20th century as well as the warming of the late 20th century. But then when you get out to trying to predict, all of a sudden it starts to predict way too much warming. That's an example of an overfit system. And I assure you, it's probably very easy to overfit financial data also. Right. But that leads to my question of skepticism, though, Patrick, is like our sole objective is to irrespective because we have internal debates when we're building models for projections towards say oil prices 
we're, we're saying, okay, guys, are we actually doing data mining or are we doing something that is, is significant here, statistically significant here? And why would the academic community, like, you know, say if I was part of the academic community, I'd be more interested in being right as opposed to what you're sort of implying, which is curve fitting. Well, I think that uh, you're maybe a little bit naive about the way this process works. Right. Uh, I'll give you an example. You, you know, you've seen in the news this story, the, the, this report from the United Nations about the dire, dire, horrific effects of 1.5 degrees Celsius of surface planetary warming. Mm -hmm. That number was not invented by science, but scientists were then employed if you will, or maybe press ganged, if you will, to support it. The 1.5 degree so-called aspirational target became a hard goal, and it was all uh, created not by scientists, but by the civilian negotiators for the Paris Climate Treaty in December of 2015. And they thought they could virtue signal by saying, oh, we're going to do better than two degrees. We're, go we're going to only go to a degree and a half, which, by the way, is physically impossible to, to limit warming to a degree and a half under many arguments. Uh, but nonetheless, having said that, then the negotiators were associated with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, directed the IPCC itself to produce a report on the dire effects of warming uh, of a mere 1.5 degrees Celsius. And they did produce that report, and it was all over the news. And, uh, you know, I can't see any scientist seriously defending the notion of the following reality. We've had 0 0.9 degrees Celsius of warming mm -hmm. since 1850. Again, uh, the warming of the early 20th century, I don't think has much to do with carbon dioxide, but the computer models have been forced to say that, and therefore the consensus of scientists Right. Has been forced to say that, but let, let me let me just finish with the absurdity. Okay. The absurdity is that if it warms a mere 0 0.6 degrees Celsius more, all the wonderful things that happened while it warmed the 0 0.9 degrees are going to reverse and go away, and it's going to turn into a horror show. For right. that 0 0.9 degrees, you got life expectancy doubling in the developed world. You got personal wealth going up more than 11 fold. Yes. To say that it, if it goes up this small amount further, all that goes away, that's an absolute absurdity. That's all I can say. And I, the fact that a team of people, none of whom were scientific names that I recognize, by the way, I have to tell you that, could put together a report that would say that just goes to show that we are now basically telling scientists what to do and in order to respond to the incentive system they seem to be doing it. And Patrick, when you're referring to the 0 0.9 percent degrees, what, uh, degrees over what duration are we talking about? Is this on an annual basis? Is this over? Like, no, it's uh, the, the 0 0.9 degrees is the total surface warming that has been observed since 1850, but there was actually none from 1850 to about 1910, so it's actually since 1910. Right. And do we, have we quantified the contribution that? man-made CO2 emissions have contributed to that 0.9% figure? We have made statements and, you know, the philosophy of the models by fitting both warmings to human influence right. is saying that it was all caused by human beings. Right. I can't imagine a group of scientists that I know sitting around a round table and to say, yeah, 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 it was all it was all human caused and, and the atmosphere is extremely sensitive and we're all going to die. No, they're not going to say that. I can tell you. Right. I've seen numbers anywhere between like 45 percent. Does that ring a bell? Like I, I, I didn't I've never I, I don't know if I've ever seen someone say like it's just outright 100 percent. Well, the models were constrained to do that. The models were constrained to or forced, if you will, to say it was 100 percent. And if. The models are the paradigm of science in this area. Many people would argue that they are. Mm. Then we are now making the paradigm that it's all caused by people. Right. And 
how much has anyone looked at the extent of the contribution towards some kind of environmental cycle? Because I've looked at, I guess, the planet Earth over millions of years, and it seems there are CO2 cycles. And do we have any statistically significant evidence that this could all be part of a cycle that the Earth is going through? Well, the CO2 that is been put the excess CO2 that's been put in the air is almost all, almost certainly a result of human activity. Right. You can tell that because it's it's fossil CO2 and is depleted in certain uh, isotopes uh, okay. that degrade over time. So yeah, no that the, the contribution of the CO2 itself is human, but has there been warmer or colder in let's say the geologically recent past? Yes, it was quite a bit warmer at the beginning of the current interglacial between six and 9,000 years ago, especially in the Northern Hemisphere. And it was sure a heck of a lot colder beginning about 11,000 years ago, which was the end of the current ice age, if you will. You know, right. you go back about maybe a couple dozen, uh, 10,000 years before that, and you've got 5,000 feet of ice over what is now Chicago. I would say okay. that's climate change. What do you think? Yep. To tease out the human influence, you have to find to find out or find a difficult prediction in the Popperian sense of greenhouse effect theory, and there is one. It is that the surface will warm, but at the same time, the stratosphere, beginning say about forty thousand feet above the surface, will cool. It's you know a lot of people say, well, global warming is global warming, so it warms everywhere. Well, no, greenhouse theory has has definitely shows that stratosphere should cool. And in fact, the strata, since the second warming of the 20th century started, which is in 1976, the stratosphere cooled. Uh, and like the surface warming, which appears to have attenuated in the late 1990s, the stratospheric cooling appears to attenuate in the late 1990s. Why that occurred, I don't know, and I don't think anybody really knows. We can, in the scientific literature, I think there somebody counted over 50 different excuses for why that's happened, which means that we just don't know what we're talking about. So so what are the ramifications of this? If the stratosphere is cooling and the surface temperature is actually heating up, I, I'm, I don't know anything about this, so that's why it's so interesting to me. <laughs> well, the question is not whether it happens, it's, it's how much it happens. Like, it's the same things that you analyze. It's not whether valuation changes, it's how much valuation changes. And that is the question in climate is not not a question of weather. It's a question of quantity. Right. And I, you know, I will tell you that the argument that fits the data the best is the argument that's being made by people like me or people like the Russian model, which is uh, the warming you're seeing is at the low end of the expected range. And once it establishes itself at the low end, it tends to maintain itself at the low end. So there's your my synthesis. That's called the lukewarm synthesis, and I, I, I rather like that word. So then it, I'm sure it implies then that you have a model yourself. And then I guess my question would be, what is it indicating to you? Actually, like, actually what I'm citing here is some recent work uh, by several people who, who are modeling the effects of anthropogenic anthropogenerated changes using, I think, more realistic inputs than are in some of the general circulation climate models. I'm thinking of the work of Nick Lewis and Judy Curry mm. uh, or the work of John Christie and Dick McKnighter from the University of Alabama. Right. Uh, their work shows a much lower warming than the general circulation models. And they're, I, uh, interestingly enough, both of those works are more observationally based Right. Well, than theoretically based. And I'm always a little bit more comfortable with observationally based models than completely theoretically based ones. So so based on your observations, Patrick, is like what what is the oil industrial complex to do in this scenario? Because it sounds like there's still a debate. And well, the oil, the, if, if, if there is such a thing. Uh, the oil industrial complex in its own rational self-interest, if you will, uh, 
has branched off into economically exploiting fuels that produce less carbon dioxide per unit energy when you use them for electricity and generation. And I'm thinking about the fracking revolution right? Uh, where we have switched uh, so much of our electrical generation from coal to natural gas and you get much less carbon dioxide per unit electricity when you burn natural gas instead of coal. So that exactly. industry is, is actually responding in, I think, rational economic ways. They're responding to competitive pressure and trying to sell product. Right. And I think I heard you in an interview one time discuss about that being one of the key components on why the United States had to withdraw from the Paris Accord. Is is that is that correct? That's quite, that, that's a little bit inverted. What I said was the United States withdrew from the Paris Accord because of it was it, I mean, Trump was right. It's, it was just an unfair, bad deal. I mean, the idea in the Paris Accord was any country could decide what it was going to do about their greenhouse gas emissions, and then that would be called a commitment. And in the Paris Accord, we committed to pretty substantial emissions reductions. The Indians, government of India, committed to substantial increases uh, and actually a decrease in their rate of uh, efficiency increase. And the Chinese uh, said, yeah, we're not going to reduce our emissions. We, They might stabilize around uh, 2030. Maybe we'll have that as a goal. But no, we're not going to reduce them during this Paris period. And so that seems like kind of not a good deal for the U.S. And ironically, we are no longer in the Paris Agreement, right. at least in principle. But we reduced our emissions more than any other nation on Earth at the same time. Right, and right. Nobody seems to understand that we did that without being compelled or constrained by an international agreement. We did it because we wanted to be more. It, it, it is economically wise to be more efficient with regard to uh, the production of things or how things that are produced work. In, in terms of the models that you discussed about, like the 30 plus models. Is any of them, com- besides from Russia, are any of them coming from the developing world, like the China and India that you just referenced? And what is their perspective on on climate change, or they're just basically not interested? I, I think in this particular model suite, don't, I mean, I might be wrong, I might have to look really closely, but I don't think that there is a developing world model. Wow. That's because I spend a lot of time in the developing world and in Asia, and I just see them highly pollutive. So <laughs> I, I think that that's one of the least of their concerns, actually, to be honest with you. Well, yeah, yeah there's just something that came out uh, in scientific literature in the last few days. You know, the world outlawed some of these uh, chlorine-containing compounds because when they get into the stratosphere, they have the ability to catalyze the destruction of ozone, right. which allows more ultraviolet in. One of them was a chemical that I'm pretty sure you're familiar with, carbon tetrachloride. You know, mm. that's a common solvent that was used in high school chemistry. It smells an awful lot like WD-40, but my understanding is WD-40 is no longer carbon tet. Maybe it never mm. was or smells like it. But uh, carbon tet levels in the atmosphere, despite its being essentially outlawed, remain constant, maybe even went up a little bit, and people were wondering, well, Where's the source of carbon tetrachloride? Right. Who's making all this carbon tetrachloride? And satellite data now shows that it's from East China. They're making it like crazy. Right. Uh, so yeah, the you know I don't think the People's Republic is is all that environmentally conscious. I can tell you how polluted it is. There's a, a cool story. As you know, temperatures in our cities are warmer than the surrounding com- countryside. The urban heat island effect because the bricks in the buildings and the pavement impede the flow of air and ventilation and all good things like that. In China, <laughs> I don't know if it's still the case, but it certainly was the case for several decades. In the big cities, the urban heat island effect is negative. Cities are cooler than the surrounding countryside because the air is so murky and opaque around the city that not enough solar radiation gets to the surface. That's a polluted atmosphere. Right, right. <laughs> I think um, we're heading towards this 30-minute uh, mark in this interview. 
I want to end this on on an interesting point that I also heard you say is like, and we kind of touched on it earlier is, what do you think would be the inherent advantage in indicating that particularly for the United States, which is probably the the country that you're covering right now, in basically citing a a precautionary tale towards man's contribution towards climate change. I I believe the precautionary principle is one of the most pernicious things you can think of. If we apply the precautionary principle, guess what? You'd probably be dead because there'd be no antibiotics by now. You probably would have died of a septic infection, infection or something like that. Right. I doubt that we would have hybrid corn or hybrid crops, and so food would be much more scarce than it is. You have to be really careful with that principle, especially when, and I'll repeat the observation, as the planet warmed nine-tenths of a degree Celsius in the developed world, life expectancy doubled. Right. And per capita wealth went up over 11 fold. You know, that's an awful lot of benefit associated with the technology that, yes, certainly was responsible for part of that nine tenths of a degree warming. Well, I don't think your precautionary principle is a real good idea if it results in half our life expectancy. Are there parties that benefit from something like this, uh, like the commoditization of, I guess, carbon uh, dioxide? Yeah. Yes. Sure, sure. That's a uh, and, and I mean I can tell you one party that really would, is itching to benefit from the commoditization of carbon dioxide. That would be governments around the world that would like to tax it and then use those taxes for whatever they want to use them for. Mm-hmm. That's certainly one way to do it, and I don't think you're going to to see a groundswell of support for that. There's a lot of publicity about it in the United States, but I would think we'll be tied the Congress person that votes for a carbon tax. Well, thank you very much, Patrick, for the conversation. I look forward to, I'm going to speak to a few other interesting individuals on the subject again, well, thank just you. to improve some of our thinking and, and hopefully we can uh, catch up sometime soon again. I really enjoy that.